these are conversations that are going on in our communities. And so we wanted to look at four subject areas. In this case, it was colorism, which is something that the Multicultural Arts Center staff and board members had talked about a lot over the years. And it's, it was an important conversation, and so the catalyst for it was an academic paper that was written by one of our board members, Precious Lopez, and then I adapted pieces of the conversations that were part of the paper and turned it into a play, and I knew immediately that we wanted to hire uh, Jackie Parker to direct it, and um, we held auditions, and uh, having watched this develop as the titular playwright of colorism, um, it was an extraordinary evolution and a great process and something, you know, difficult. It's difficult to talk about, it's difficult to reflect, um, but it's a topic that needs to be understood because it's, you know, second cousin to racism. So it's there, it's predicated on all of those same ground rules, which is another discussion that we're going to be having, another facilitated dialogue along with immigration and education. For a lot of Afro-Latinas, we, we are brought up with a lot of pain and a lot of um, self-hate and a lot of really trying to not be as black as we feel and as we know we are. What drew me to this was um, my own experiences growing up in a predominantly white community and constantly, as an adult, having to let go of some of the internalized oppression that I experienced as a result of that. My sense of beauty coming into natural hair was awesome. Mm -hmm. Learning how to take care of natural hair was yeah. its own adventure because <laughs> I wasn't taught this growing up. I was taught to perm my hair. I was taught to straighten everything out and to try to become as Eurocentric as possible. I wanted to be involved because as men of color, we kind of drive this conversation sometimes because of the choices that we make um, in our lives about the kinds of women that we're attracted to, the kinds of women that we're not attracted to. So, you know, this was really a little soul searching for me. We as people of color, not just black people, but people of color from uh, Asian societies, people of color from uh, Latino societies, any racial community that has a spectrum from dark to light, colorism affects them.
I come from a multi-ethnic and multi-racial family. This particular topic is important to me, not only as a person of color, but as one who values and expresses the need to understand their cultural history and heritage. Colorism is a social construction that broadly takes on the perspectives of other social constructions, such as racism. It creates a cultural blueprint of prejudice and discrimination amongst those in the same racial category. The psychology of colorism is a form of conditioning that plagues people and causes them to repeat the cycle of discrimination that they have experienced, a vicious cycle. My thoughts and perceptions of colorism as it relates to my own sense of self have come a long way from a young child to an adult woman. I remember growing up as a child and in the summers playing outside with friends and thinking to myself, ooh, I don't want to be out here too long in the summer. <laughs> it is only now that I know it was my fear of becoming too dark that made me think that. Mm -hmm. Colorism is so embedded into yeah. what we think that it appears normal. The ideology of colorism was not something that was made apparent to me, but rather became both a subliminal and ongoing issue in my life. Mm -hmm. While conducting interviews, I generated questions about skin tone, and from there went to direct questioning about the impact of those on life-related issues. Mm -hmm. What do you think about your skin tone? I wish I was lighter. Yes, no. ma'am. No. I wish I was darker. No. Mm. I love me. Yes, I love me. <laughs> I love me. How important is skin tone when choosing a romantic partner? Very important. Yes. Yes. Not important. Not important. Mm. Somewhat important. Yes. <laughs> okay. I wish to marry someone of a lighter skin tone. Yes. Yes. No. No? Doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. <laughs> I'd prefer to marry someone of a darker skin tone, yes? Yes. 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 <laughs> no? No. Doesn't matter? Doesn't, Doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter.
because I'm not a white person. And I feel that I've definitely been cited a few times because I'm not white. I think there are work experiences that I've had to question, and it might have been easier for me if I was a white woman. <coughs> And you know, I, I see it in the older generation. And I think that has to do with the fact that Haysburg was colonized by the Portuguese. You know, we didn't get our independence until 1975. Wow, 1975. Now my sister and I, we're about, we're about the same skin tone. She might be a little bit darker. And I, I have no problem most of the time, identifying as African American. And I can't say the same for her. Now, my sister and I, we're, we're practically on the same skin tone spectrum, but we both identify differently. We discussed mate selection and relationship history. Astrid describes herself as an equal opportunity dater. So when choosing a mate, Skin tone doesn't matter. It just so happens that everyone she's dated happens to be outside of her race, with the exception of one African American male. Her reasoning for dating outside of her race <clears throat> has to do with being a product of her environment. She grew up and was raised in a predominantly white neighborhood. And from activities and hobbies that interested her, there were very few African American men in attendance, and those that were were mostly interested in white women. She does, however, go on to mention that if she were to date more than one African-American male, the skin tone wouldn't matter in terms of light to dark. But then to her elders, her mother and grandmother in particular, it would matter. Not for me, but for my mama and nana, it would be something they would comment on and make little remarks about. If I were to be interested in someone and they were darker than me, they'd say, ooh, your face are gonna be so dark. <laughs> I mean, my mama and my nana are from a different time. My mom was born in 1949, so color, I think, is important. If I were to have children, they're gonna have to go through the same things I had to go through in this world, things that I had to endure. And it may be better for them, but it'll still break my heart to see them go through that. I really want brown babies. <laughs> but the way the children in my family have been, they've all just come out really, really white. <laughs> Our baby is gonna be translucent. <laughs>
the uh, dialogue and what the consequences of colorism within communities of color had been. And those stories were so evocative of pieces of that that it's almost like, you know, the play could write itself. Like if you can conceptualize, okay, well, this particular piece, you know, this could be several characters. Let's develop the characters. Let's see what those characters would look like. And um, so we sort of started with a smaller group and then sort of expanded it. And part of that had to do with the audition process, et cetera, because there were so many, they were all incredibly talented actors. And so when you asked earlier, was I surprised? No. When you're sitting there in rehearsal and you're watching it happen, you go, oh my God, this is so powerful. And it's, I knew it was going to be good, but this is like really good. And so that night, um, when it just unfolded, it was people I think were, you know, really emotionally gripped by it. It's a short play. It has a running time of about 15 minutes. And we asked Janice Pryor, who had been involved many years before as a board member of the Multicultural Arts Center, and as one of the folks that helped to conceptualize the Arts and Dialogues on Race program. So her background was intensely appropriate, so to speak, and I think that as a facilitator, she was, as always, outstanding. Um, I hope that possibly she will join us for some of our other facilitated dialogues, but that hasn't been totally worked out yet. And I think that the, the questions that were raised and the comments that members of the audience had in regard to the play and their own personal experiences were sincerely felt and um, important to hear. Because in addition to all the folks that were in the audience that night, through this video, for example, we have a way for folks to, who weren't there to see it and then to tell other folks about it and then to have them watch and to get the ideas and the feelings and the understandings that were developed that night to pass it on to the larger community. So why is white still such an important color in the 21st century? Why is that? Okay. <laughs> 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 I believe that one of the reasons, or a primary reason, that colorism has such a power in the 21st century is that we have yet to deal with racism and what that is and has been until we start to unpack um, the explicit and implicit um, performances of racism, then we're not going to get rid of this colorism thing. You said a really profound thing, many really profound things, but I'm going to extrapolate this one. Any racial category that has a spectrum that runs from dark to light, yes, has issues of colorism. <coughs> so you're talking about, yes, you're talking about the Asian population, but you're also talking about the white population. White people police each other at high levels. They are as invested in colorism as an option of racism as everybody else, but it is from a different trajectory. Um, and we miss that, yes, because of the dynamic impact that racism has had on African diaspora peoples of color. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about some of those subcategories as poverty, some of those subcategories as economic advancement, some of those subcategories is health and well-being mm -hmm. and health disparities that happens directly as a result of racism and colorism. Mm -hmm. So those, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. So those of you who are white, what do you think? How aware are you of this problem that plagues not only people of color, particularly women of color, for reasons we may or may not have time to go into, um, what do you think? 
I'm curious about why white people are here tonight and what they hope to get out of this. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, I'm here because as a white man, I'm aware of the power, somewhat aware of, of the power that comes, social power, that comes with that as being white, and male, as well educated. And a lot of it isn't earned whatsoever, it just is. It's the scene of the racism of this society. And I really um, try to oppose it. And so I need to keep educating myself as to what it looks like and how it behaves. And this is this colorism question I, I really agree with you. It's, it's, it's a piece of the racism that starts with white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. That's rooted in colonialism, slavery, mm -hmm. capitalism, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it has a deep, powerful life. And so I think I'm here to help. I feel like it's about opening the conversation. As a woman, I, I'm a fiance Haitian. And I remember when we first started living together for like over six years now, and when we started going out, it, it took me so much time to like, <clears throat> I don't know, talk about it. And he's not somebody who's going to go out and talk about, you know, what he's grown up at, like, the world that he's grown up in. And he'd make comments sometimes about, oh, that person's following me, or, oh, they're looking at me funny. And I'd be like, oh, no, don't worry about it. And that shows my privilege, you know, as someone who is not a person of color, you know. It's true. Like, I, I mean, I, I always gave everyone, and I still do it. I see the world through rose-colored glasses because I've been given the opportunity to and like coming out here tonight to, to listen to these stories, it's, it, I don't know, it gives me, I mean, it gives me an idea of what people, what everybody's going through, what other people of color are going through specifically. And um, I appreciate that opportunity, and thank you so much for writing this piece and bringing it to life because it's, I'm still struggling with it, and still struggling with talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's why it's, kind of the conversation has gone on, I, I think about two issues, both power and representation, mm -hmm. and kind of where they intersect. Um, representation of, of you know, why, why, is, why is white considered, um, you know, above, right? Why is white held up, held up? Um, and I, I think about how there is there's just more, in our popular culture, more representation of success mm -hmm. from those who are more white. Um, access to education, access to economic and well-being. You see the spotlight series in Boston Globe, the disparities in that work between African American and African American color versus white families and static. Um, as a person of Indian descent, you know, one of the comments that was made during the piece about um, one of the women who uh, is a woman of color but also has primarily dated um, white men. You know, I'm a, an Indian man of Indian descent. My wife here, put her on the spot, um, is white. <laughs> and I love her, I think she's beautiful, but I also can't help but think about how my definition of beauty has been shaped by representation throughout my life growing up in the United States. I think it's actually um, sort of like what you said. I think it's because we keep rewarding it. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> You know, I mean, I think it's as simple as that. Like, if we, every, if everyone actually made a conscious choice to stop rewarding whiteness, I, you know, that's, I mean, there's a huge shift. And it's not just about literally just rewarding, like, white people, but it's about um, only rewarding um, people of color who are, who are lighter. It's, um, it, it's, it's that, it's rewarding traits that we deem as being white. Um, so I think that's really, it sounds so simple, but that's where it comes from. Because if there was if there were no reward to it, you would stop doing it. And I, I've never thought this thought until tonight of like why is it a thing? And I, I'm wondering if there's even like a deeper tectonic thing that is being assigned to color skin but goes further back in our DNA that like, light is associated with different things from dark and that that's being uh, transposed onto how they perceive certain people. Mm -hmm. I thought that too. Tonight and then um, you asked why white folks here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 
here because I care about the arts center, and I care about arts in Cambridge, and because I run a theater company, and I'm curious to learn about more artists of color in our community. But also, something I've been thinking about largely as a person in the world right now is like the relationship and the dynamic between white women and particularly women of color in our country. Because on the one hand, I feel that we've like shared a certain amount of subjugation, and then on the other hand, white women have enjoyed these like massive advantages. And then on the other hand, I see like white women across the country voting against their own interests like all the time. <laughs> and women of color seem to not be voting against their own interests. And I'm like curious how to like get a hold of all of that and and speak to it and change it. So none of those is really questions. They're just in response. <laughs> Inside, I'm going, really? <laughs> really? You don't know? You don't know? And that would be out of line. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder about the necessity for intergenerational conversations. Mm -hmm. What we, as quote, old people, can not only teach you, but share with you in terms of telling you our stories about our experience with. Colorism, which is, is you know, it's, it, I feel funny getting the word out of my mouth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we have stories we can share, and you have stories that we need to hear. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the origin of your perspective because you are the future. So I, I want to throw out uh, lessons, you know, and ask all of us what kind of lessons we can learn from each other about this very painful subject, because whether you're 15 or 55 or 75, and you're a woman of any color, we got some pain going on around this. Some serious pain that has been in this country, at least, since slavery. Well, I'm a student of 18 years, so I just graduated from Northern uh, Nevada. Uh, I just wanted to refer to your question like, like a while back um, about the teachers and like how there's not many black teachers or like minority teachers in our schools. I think when we did, when I was there, I think there's about like 120 teachers. I, I could be lying completely, but um, total in our school, I and mean, maybe there's like 10 or like 15. Um, teachers of color, and that was a big question of like, why? Do you know what I mean? Why is that uh, a thing? Why are, like, you know, why is it just a white teacher? You know what I mean? And it's, I don't think, for me, I probably had a teacher of color maybe twice throughout like my, all the 12 years of school. Do you know what I mean? And that's a problem because then I think I go around thinking that a teacher is supposed to be white, and you know what I mean? And there's like, you know, even like there's history teachers that talk, or like black history teachers that are like, you know, white. And I'm just like, okay, where are the teachers of color? You know what I mean? Where are the teachers of color? And there's not many. So we went around and asked the question, and I think that they're currently doing that in the school because that's, it's really an issue, you know what I mean? And I think that what we came up with was there's not much of a push for um, being an educator in the black community. Because you know what I mean, we're like striving for something more, but we forget the teachers are like the soul. You know what I mean? They're, they're, <laughs> you know what I mean? They teach everyone else, and we need that. We need that. Like my dad is, uh, he's retired now. He was an English teacher. Um, he graduated from BC. He was like, he was like one of the first hundred black graduates from BC. You know what I mean? So like, and it's stuff like that, and it's like you don't see that every day. And I'm just so glad to have like an educator in the family, like especially a black man. That's that's great for me to know. And that's that's something that pushed me. But a lot of people don't have that. Do you know what I mean? And that's something that I'm like, that's so important. And that's why I'm glad that you're asking the question, especially as a principal. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm glad that you're aware. I read a book called Sister Outsider by Audrey Lord, who's a lesbian feminist, black lesbian feminist. And um in one of her essays in the book, she writes about your issue. Um, and I, I remember her talking about, in a school where there's predominantly white teachers and they're teaching black students, 
they'll say, if a, if a black kid says, oh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, they say, oh my god, I can't believe you know that, great job. <laughs> but then if, they, if a white kid says 2 plus 2 equals 4, they just say correct. So the expectations for black children and white children are different. I think in a school where you already have all white faculty, the thing that they, you can put in place is books and education for those teachers. Because even if they can't change their skin color, they can change what they know mm -hmm. and how they give what they know to the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, I really agree with this. I think that there's something about having educators that look like you that encourage you to really push yourself to your maximum potential. And that's what it's really about. When you tell a student that's of color, oh wow, yes, you got that very easy thing correct, it raises the bar of like accomplishment to something so base. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being able to be like, excellent, now let's go further, let's push it harder, let's find how we can maximize what we can do so that the student has inside a high bar of expectation to climb towards. Mm -hmm. And I think- And not the minimum. And not the minimum. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what it's truly about is really being able to be able to push students with love and that often comes there's so much guardedness there's so much stuff in between um, people of color and, and and white educators that it's I know for me it was so hard for me to trust what was being said um, but when I would see a person of color who was in the classroom with me I'd be like yeah you get it so here's what it is and when I was being challenged I was able to receive that because I was challenged with love and held high expectation not just by somebody who looked at like me but all the ancestors and people that came before and that came with them and that's real I would challenge this organization or organizations like it who have information like this to put the interviews out on social media mm -hmm. and have it shared. Like for what you were saying as far as the suffrage movement and classism and how that relates, there are a few videos that tackle history and try to like share that information. It, you know, it's a part of education and it's very important that it get out there. And I feel like we would find a lot of success. I feel like um, when I was younger, growing up in the 80s, you had PSAs put up by various, um, sometimes it was, I feel like, cities or um, networks, or you would have it, things like the Schoolhouse Rock, where people who are from that time, they still remember it now, and they can probably recite every single word from those 30, 40 minute PSAs, so it's a, I mean, they were, they were very powerful too, so I feel like, again, I mean, I love that everything you said coming from your perspective as a teacher, and um, I think that, you know, we can, jump on the internet and share it that way. What do we do about the pain? Mm -hmm. And secondly, where do we go from here? Because this can't be the end. This can't be the last chapter. This has to be the first chapter. And we need to go forward because we're facing some extraordinary obstacles in this country. Politically, socially, it's out there. So I want you to think about where we go next. And I also want you to think about what we do about the pain. And can there be an intergenerational sharing? I realize the biggest thing that I can do first and foremost is listen. Because I, I didn't know how much of a privilege I had until I started listening to everybody in class. And that's what I always enjoyed, is hearing the stories and figuring out what I can do. So I'm, I'm a retail manager. So what I do is I take people and, you know, some of my, my most, you know, dear employees in my heart are the college students who have come. A lot of people are from the uh, Dominican Republic. And how I can support them to achieve their dreams because they say, I don't know if I can work part-time and go to full school full-time. I say, how do you make this work? How can I support someone so that they can achieve their dreams, so that they can then push the next person to achieve their dream, right? Like, I can come to these events, I can be an ally, I can listen, so that the next person that tells me their story, I can be like, I know you're not alone. I can't relate to it because I haven't been in some of those situations that you are, but I can listen. I can help support you with the tools, and I can try and inspire you to get higher than I am, so then you can influence those people that will be around you too. And it's like, that's why I continuously come to, to events like this, or you know, see how I can expand my circle, because I know that's 
basically the first step of what I have in my power to do. I mean, as someone mentioned before, right, I, I'm a woman, so I feel some of that institutionalization. But being able to code switch and realizing now how lucky I am to be able to code switch into the white world and be able to, to have that power and that privilege, I try to use that power to bring those around me up with me because that is what I can do and can control. So like, thank you for having an open dialogue and allowing me to listen because I think that's the first step for us to start realizing and figuring out those answers because it truly has to be a collaboration. And many people are at the point of being stuck of what do I do next? Yeah. And places like this are where we'll get those answers together. Conversation is key. And it's funny because I'm listening to, to the woman talk and I'm like, my God, I've had this conversation with my friends or relatives a thousand bajillion times, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's never an answer. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's so, and I think you pointed to this point, and I'm just to that. There's been, it's so many layers of layers of layers of layers. It's going to take forever to sort of peel those layers away because they've taken so long to be put down, right? Mm -hmm. But the conversation is a start. Yes. But I'm discovering, like, even within my own family, like, the how people identify, mm -hmm. you know, and it's such a, and you know, I forgot someone said something about um, not using black or African American, and I'm just like, it drives me crazy when people just label every black person as African American because we're not all African American, right? right. right. You you've completely right. annihilated like a, 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 a bunch of people, and we're just like, my aunt hates when she gets labeled as African American, and she'll tell you, she says, I am not African American, mm -hmm. I'm black, mm -hmm. I'm Haitian, mm -hmm. you know, don't call me African American, mm -hmm. and it's just like. It, it, it drives me crazy, and so it's like, but you don't know that if you're not having that conversation. Right. Because I know tons of black people who only label black people black if they're American. Right. Oh no, she's not black, she's Haitian. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's not black, she's African. I'm not, we can't have this conversation with people, right? <laughs> so, and that's what needs to happen. This conversation needs to continue. I don't know where we go from here, to be quite honest. But, um, and I don't know how to help white folks either, you know, because I'm so concerned about the black folk and how, how can we get to an understanding where we can look at each other and say, oh, you're Dominican, girl, you do black. You know what I mean? Because we, I know some Dominicans who are like, no, I'm just Dominican. We can't have a conversation, I don't think, right? But because we now you, we can't have a conversation, yes. but it's just yes. like, you've already told me mm -hmm. that you don't want, you know, you can't hear me anymore, right? Because like when we're sharing and we're, but anyway, I think you all know. Actually, but you know what I'm saying? But the conversation needs to continue. Yes, that's and, all um, so that we can understand where each other's coming from and how do we identify and share that?